All right, so it's nine o'clock. Uh, thinking we'll get started. Wow, like wow, what a this is this is a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to try our best, do our best to host our session this morning on the green number talk book, as I think a lot of people will refer to it. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, okay. Should I just start introducing us here, Lori? Yeah, well, we'll want to start with our oh yes, sorry. Yeah. Right. Of course. Okay. So we're going to start with our territorial land acknowledgement. Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, so on our picture here, I've got some pictures of around my area, which is Bright's Grove. We acknowledge on the land that which we are gathered is part of the traditional territory of the Chippewa, Odawa, Potawatomi, and Delaware nations. By personally making a land acknowledgement, I'm making the commitment to care for the land for future generations. I really enjoy walking around Brent's Grove and walking along the lake. And um, I just think the colors right now are so beautiful. I just, I can't uh, get enough of them. I just think they're so pretty. So these are just various pictures that were taken along the shores of Lake Huron and one actually from the Pinery. Um, and those are all part of Treaty 29. I feel very privileged to enjoy this, this uh, beautiful land that we live on. And I think it's so important to be appreciative of it and grateful for everything that it provides for us. Cool, please. Hmm. So I think we've kind of done this already. <laughs> Yeah, we've sort of introduced yourselves in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, hosting today are myself, Leslie Fraley, uh, Lori Meyer, and Jordan Black. And um, like I said, we're gonna do our best to do a walkthrough of the Green Number Talk book. And please feel free to unmute if you have any questions. Um, ask questions in the chat. We'll be trying to monitor that. Um, yeah, anything to add? Add to that, Lori or Jordan? No, that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Sounds good. <clears throat> okay, we're just gonna, I don't know. I just, I can't hear the story enough. So if you've already <laughs> heard it, I apologize. <laughs> but I think it's a good one because I think it really, uh, really just sums up why we need to develop that understanding of fractions in students as young as possible. So. Again, I'll try to make it short if you've already heard this story, but um, I was actually in the classroom last week and they were talking about this story. So I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So McDonald's had always um, marketed their quarter pounder, right? Quarter pounder, quarter pounder, quarter pounder. And so then NW wanted to sort of get on board with this. So they came out uh, with their third pounder and they kept the focus on using fresh beef as Consumers seem to think that that was uh, much more preferable to then the frozen hockey pucks uh, being served by other fast food chains. And they aggressively marketed this larger and fresher burger, but also promoting the fact that it was being uh, chosen in blind taste tests and it didn't even cost more. So with all of this information, so anyways, it really didn't go well. It didn't go well at all. So all this information finding out, okay, why are we not, why is this not going well? They hired researchers to a very expensive, actually, uh, researching marketing campaign. And they realized that basically it was because people thought that a third, they were comparing a third pounder to a quarter pounder. I don't know, did I say that Adrian W called there's the third pounder? And so basically they thought that the quarter pounder um, well, I'm losing my words. Sorry, jump in here. <laughs> quarter pounder was more, right? Yeah, the quarter, quarter pounder, pounder was because... more because four is larger than three. And so they were thinking that there was more meat in the McDonald's quarter pounder than the A&W third pounder. And then, uh, yeah, they almost went out of business because of it. They had to really uh, slow down their, their marketing or I guess their business portfolio. I think they had to just focus in on the root beer and uh, try to get their business back. So yeah, I just think it's kind of a funny story. It is, and just shows that general lack of knowledge about fractions that is out there. Yes. Okay, 
So there are four foundational pr principles of number talks, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about the original blue book that has the um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, or this book, it still has the same foundational principles. Uh, the first one is just uh, creating that safe learning environment which students feel like they can share, they can make mistakes, um, and uh, right, we wanna hear their thinking. So making that safe learning community is the first principle. Using purposeful problems. So lucky for us, they're already planned for us. <laughs> Both books, there are strings that um, we can just go ahead and follow and go in a sequential order. And those problems are going to um, sort of nudge students towards using a particular strategy or build some foundational um, understanding to be able to work towards what's coming next. So building some, uh, this book, building some ideas about you know, fractions and decimals to then being able to order them. So it's, uh, they all are very purposeful in the way that they're laid out in the book for us. Record with purpose. So as teachers, we're the facilitators and our job is to record the student thinking. Um, and there's just a little picture here that through the book, just like the other one, there's lots of examples of how you can record different strategies. I find these really valuable for me because I know when we went to school, maybe we used a lot of different procedural type of um, ways to solve fractions. And these really show us ways that students might think about them and break them down after learning all those foundations and they're starting to use operations. So um, lots of those throughout the book for us to use. And then the last principle, again, as a facilitator is knowing when to ask and when to tell. So that's a key, key principle there that we're not doing all the talking. I think that one is, uh, it's, it's difficult, right? I feel like myself, I'm trying to train myself not to, not to talk so much and not to um, give them information as much, right? I think because that's sort of how we were always taught, it was always the sit and get and then go practice. But I think we need to make that shift from telling and um, showing and try to focus. A I know I'm personally trying to ask more questions and also listen to their thinking more. So then that we can sort of guide them to sort of construct their own ideas because mathematic mathematics is really about relationships among numbers and they need to, they need to sort of be able to construct those for themselves in their own mind. And I think that's one of the really uh, important things of number talks, right? Is allowing them, giving them the time to construct those information, those, those ideas, those relationships for themselves. Yeah. I think um, it's really easy yeah, for us to I think sit and tell them everything and we need to take Yeah, and that uh, really fits in with the mathematical processes too, right? They're supposed to be reasoning, they're supposed to be communicating. So how are we gonna um, do that? There was a question about, should there be a book like this in your school? There's not one in every school, I don't believe. I would highly recommend asking your principal to purchase one for you. Um, it is a key resource. Um, so definitely have a conversation with your principal. Maybe there's one hiding in your school somewhere, or maybe your principal would be willing to purchase one for you. So that would be my um, suggestion there. I know the school I was at last week, I actually, a teacher had gotten one from a retired teacher. And so then I was like, oh, everybody can come and ask this teacher because they've got the book. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, it is a great book to have. Uh, okay. So I was thinking we should show everybody, you know, what expectations you're going to cover if you use this book. And as I just started looking through the curriculum, I started finding words like compare and order. And we're talking like decimals, fractions. And then I kept going and I found more quantities. Um, converting between fractions, decimals, and percents, um, the, the operations between fractions, decimals, and percents, addition and subtraction of fractions, the multiplication and division of fractions, the um, mental math with like percentages, decimals, and fractions all was in there. So <laughs> I started to realize, wow, like this book actually covers a ton of expectations. and um, so you're going to make many, many curriculum connections. And then if you get to um, maybe 
you're thinking like, oh, I need to do a unit on fraction decimals and percents. Maybe you don't have to do that unit like you would have traditionally because you've already started to cover and dig into this while you're doing the book. So there's just so many connections to the curriculum through this and also the processes as we were just talking about. So I thought that was kind of neat as I started to dig into that. I wanted to share that with you. I don't know if we wanted to just quickly answer like uh, Trevor's question that he had in the very beginning about, oh, yeah. yeah, like I don't, that might be sort of a good oh, spot sorry. to that. Um, so in the very beginning, Trevor was asking like, would you start with the blue book and then move into the green book? Um, I feel like, well, Jordan, maybe I'll let you speak to it a little bit more. I feel mm -hmm. like in, it, depending on your grade level, but um, maybe doing a little bit of both all the way throughout the year so that when you get to your fraction unit, um, you don't have to start at the very beginning with uh, just making sure they have a good understanding of it. But yeah, Jordan, I'll let you speak to that a bit more. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Leslie, I think uh, everyone is at a different point in their number talks journey. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm coming from a, a six, seven, eight lens. Um, so I thought it was best to kind of pair them in conjunction with one another. Um, I like that it kind of broke up the week a little bit. So, you know, I might do the whole number talk book Mondays and Wednesdays and the fraction book Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so that it was a little bit different for myself uh, as well as students. Um, it is nice to do it that way because a lot of the strategies do pair um, from the whole number talk book to the fractions, decimals, and percent book. So uh, that is really helpful. Um, and as Lori said, like one really nice aspect of using this book um, is that obviously students are getting fractions on a weekly basis instead of like that one unit. Um, but also it kind of helps you because you're tying so many um, curriculum expectations into like that short, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes per day. Um, so it kind of gives you a longer time to, to spend with some of the other units. Um, so I found that very helpful. So instead of doing like a whole fraction unit, just, you know, one time in January, you're doing fractions um, every day or every week and you're building on them. Mm -hmm. Great. So I would say in a perfect world, you would be using both, um, but it depends, right? You might be in a 7-8 and you might feel that after you've done some multiplication and division through the whole number talk book, maybe you feel that your students just need uh, the fraction decimals percent, right? As you've kind of said, like you need to be responsive and you know your class and you know what they need. So um, I think that's the best way to go. Yeah. Um, I guess we will jump into the big ideas. Yeah, I just saw Brennan oh. had a question here. When okay. some students finish problems really early, aside from asking them if they can show their thinking in other ways, how can we engage them while students are catching up? So I think first, just like when we're doing the number talks, this is more of like a whole group or small group sort of activity. Lots of times teachers are just doing them, you know, on the smart board with the whole class. So everyone's engaged all at the same time there and listening to each other's thinking and discussing each other's thinking. Um, or some teachers choose to do number talks in small groups because they're kind of targeting um, maybe more specific strategies their students need to work on. I feel like Brennan, your question almost relates to the other um, math um, um, session that's happening today that's kind of on the curriculum and on uh, like programming. So I know they're gonna talk about different ideas in there where it's, um, you know, um, more independent practice or different types of things you can do within your classroom. You know, if Jordan or Leslie have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, like I think that that's a struggle in every room, right? Our, our gaps in abilities are huge no matter what classroom you walk into. And I guess in terms of trying to meet everybody's needs, that's if we use those problem strings where that first one is sort of usually quite simple so that we can get everybody in on it. And then by the end, your last question in the string is maybe sometimes I'll even say like, this is a challenge question to really make sure you still have, you know, your higher level one, your higher level thinkers who breeze through the first couple, mm -hmm. um, keep them engaged in thinking by the end. I know it is, it's definitely a struggle to make sure you're hitting every ability, especially now that our, our gaps are so big. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, Lori, uh, or sorry, Leslie, Lori, both of you. Um, I've kind of done the same thing as you were saying, Leslie, where at times I've put two questions on the board um, and kind of separated them quite a bit. And then I've said to students, you can jump in at the one that you feel is right for you. And we're gonna take both of them up, both of them are gonna use the same strategies. Um, and then you'll have lots of students who will solve the easier one first and they'll work on the second one. And then those students who can't maybe solve the second one or it's a little bit challenging for them, they have access to that first one. And then they're gonna hear their peers solve the second one and maybe that's gonna help them, right? So um, that could be a way. Um, obviously, if you could do small groups and really target um, where they're at would be ideal, but we know that sometimes that that doesn't happen or it's too tricky to happen or yeah. things happen. Yeah. yeah. Or even doing like a small group number talk, you know, once a week or something like that and trying to make sure you're, yeah, it's a challenge for sure. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kelly, sorry, got the name <laughs> mixed up. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Yeah. Jordan, do you want to jump into the big ideas here that we uh, what kind of gets into? Yeah, for sure. Um, so as we said, you know, obviously in an ideal world, we would all have lots of time to go through this book and read it as a book study or within a group of people and chat about it, and make notes and all that fun stuff. But we are realistic people. Um, so chapter three is a really good chapter to uh, dive into if you don't have the time to read the whole book right now, because uh, that really gets into the big ideas and why students struggle. These big ideas are really, really important um, for teachers to be thinking about when teaching fractions, and also um, if students are gonna be successful with fractions, they have to have an understanding of these big ideas. Um, so just to go over them quickly, uh, some of them are, you know, whole number reasoning is different as we know, but um, a lot of our students try to apply their whole number reasoning to fractions, which really gets them mixed up. Um, you know, we've all seen that when they're looking at the denominator and they say, well, you know, the denominator is bigger in one number versus another number. So it's a bigger number, right? So uh, that's a common misconception that I think we've all seen. Um, when we multiply a given number by a proper fraction, the result is a smaller amount, which usually tends to uh, trick kids a little bit and get them a little bit messed up. You know, taking six and times a half, we're going to get three. Um, so the, the great thing about this number talk book that I can say as an educator is it really showed me how um, when I was solving a fraction question, I would just go to a procedure, something that I was taught back in school. Um, and I didn't really know why I was doing what I was doing. I was just doing it. And this really opened up my eyes. Um, to how you can deal with fractions um, in a different way where you actually understand what you're doing and your students will start to understand what they're doing. So it is a really, really awesome book. Um, so another big thing that trips up students and that they need to understand is that there's multiple interpretations. Uh, so for example, if you think about three quarters of a dozen cookies have sprinkles or three quarters of a brown who's eaten or three, quarter, three quarters of the jewels are red. So students are gonna see multiple interpretations and they need to understand, they need to be able to uh, identify the whole, right? If they can't un identify the whole, then they are gonna be lost. I was just gonna add to that, Jordan, there's a good part, part in that chapter two about um, how, like just telling kids that information doesn't ensure that they understand it. And so we need to make sure we're providing these situations or tasks to encourage uh, students to construct those understandings themselves. And I think probably when we were all in school, we were just told these things, <laughs> which is probably why I never had a good understanding of fractions. And now that we have all these different um, ways to teach it and visuals to use and uh, mathematical tools we can use, it sort of helps uh, create that understanding for them. You have to see it to believe it. That's right. <laughs> actually experience it. Yeah, right. for sure. Great point. All right, we are going to flip over to a jam board here and actually start to try and dig into the book a bit more and show you what some of these number strings are all about and how they progress. Yeah. So the first uh, chapter that sort of starts getting into examples of number talks that you can actually use in your classroom is chapter four. And so chapter four is uh, number talks that help build fractional reasoning. Um, it sort of takes us through here. You can see the ones we've got up. 
uh, they've got some area modeled ones, some set model ones, and some linear model ones. Um, they sort of seem like they might be simple, but I think it's really important because then they build the foundation. Also, for those of you who are wondering, like, oh, I, I think this book just meant be might be meant for you know older grades. Like these first number talks are actually great to do with even like grade three, grade four. I think I've even eh, maybe used a couple of them in a grade two room last Perfect year. Perfect timing there, Leslie. Amy was just asking in the chat, is the green book more appropriate for JI? Okay. As you get into it, definitely. But this yeah. first chapter, what we're showing right now, mm -hmm. there are definitely things you could pull out for more, maybe not grade one and two, but no. grade three and four as they're starting to understand like what the half, what the quarters, so developing some of those benchmark fractions. Mm -hmm. um, this beginning of chapter four, definitely uh, you could use. Yeah. Uh, so those are some examples of those first sort of more foundational number talks. So we're gonna head over to slide two there, Lori. And so that these ones, I, I don't know, I just really like these number talks because I feel like they really help students get that idea to like reason through their thinking. Um, so these ones is the fraction closer to zero, one half or one whole, and how do you know? So we thought we might try this out sort of together as a group. Um, if you want to pipe up or unmute and say like what students might say, and then we'll try. I know part of the scary part, I think about this book, Lori and I talk about this all the time is like, how are we going to represent their thinking? So we thought if we did a little bit of thinking through that together today, then it might make some of us feel a bit more comfortable diving in and, and using these number talks. I think we're kind of used to representing the thinking of students for the whole number blue book, but this one is a little bit uh, scarier. <laughs> Yes, we did, Trevor. We took some photos from the book and put them in the jam board to share yeah. with you today. Um, which one are we going to start with, Leslie? Three uh, let's start with three eighths. So if three eighths is the, yep. close, is the fraction closer to zero, one half, or one whole, and how do you know? What do you think students might say? Like, how might they explain it? Um, I would say that the students, that students may think that it's closer to one whole because it has a big denominator. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the chat, we're hearing manipulatives or maybe a number line might help. Right. So I was thinking that we could uh, hopefully somebody might raise their hand and say, well, I thought of it as on a number line. And so if we take our number line and we do from zero to one whole, and we know that eight eighths are one whole. Yeah. And in the chat, we have uh, some students might know four eighths of a half. Right. So if four eighths is one half. And so then we can kind of partition. All right. So that's going to be two eighths. And this is going to be three eighths. And we can kind of see that three eighths is only one jump away from four eighths, which is a half. And we can, oh, I didn't put that one in there, but we can see it's one, two, three jumps away from zero. Ooh. Yeah. Janine had a nice point here that her students know um, about the numbers being close together or far apart. So for example, the numerator and the denominator here are far apart. Okay. Um, so then they're further from a whole, right? The closer they are together, the closer to a whole. Right. Good thinking too. And I guess I'm also wondering, like, how can we show that? Maybe we can show that using a model, an area model. Uh, one of the book, one of the things the book talks about, and there's other some other talk out there now about um, how really we don't want to use circles when we're teaching fractions, even though that's what we've always talked about year after year, like pies and pizzas and so on. But we want to sort of get away from using only circles when we're representing fractions because they're really hard to partition equally for students. And so we want to make sure we're showing some other models as well. Yeah. As so, soon as you get into seventh, <laughs> eighth, yeah. ninth circles become very frustrating for students. So That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh nice. Andy does and Teresa. I agree. <laughs> but the emoji in the chat. I agree with Ms. Clark. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect number talk move. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so number lines, area models, any other way that students might think of it? Anybody want to add any to that? Uh, the only other thing I can think of is because we know in the beginning of the book, they're exposed to area models, number line, and a set model. Mm -hmm. So some students could draw a set model. They could draw mm -hmm. eight circles mm -hmm. and color three of them in, and that they would know that that is uh, less than a half of them colored yeah. in. Yeah. All right. Should we quickly do four tenths or do you want to move on to yours? I don't even know what the time is or how we're doing for time. 925. It's 925. Um, I guess my thinking was with the four tenths, then they might also make that connection to decimals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my yeah. only thinking with that. So yeah, the chocolate bar analogy. So that's a lot like that, that area model there that Leslie drew, like, right? I only get three eighths of the chocolate bar. Is that fair for splitting? If I get three eighths and you get, you know, five eighths, <laughs> right? Then I'm no, I'm getting less than a half. Yeah. Yeah. Two eighths is a quarter, which is the same as halfway to a half. So three eighths just a little more. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So lots of great, great thinking there that our students can share. And as they get to hear each other's thinking about it too, they gain some more understanding as well. Yeah, I think it's inter like it's good for kids to hear how other kids thought about it. Yeah, I think maybe let's keep moving along because we okay. have a lot more to share. Sounds good. Okay. So after they have had time to sort of build their benchmark fractions, they start to um, build their fractional reasoning through these other talks that connect, start to connect fractions to percentages. So the first um, set of um, strings is basically like this one here where they're converting like or making an equivalent fraction to percentage. Um, they're using their benchmark fractions they know so they would already kind of know that a quarter is like 25 percent and one eighth they know is sort of in between halfway in between a quarter and one eighth so that would be half of 25 percent so they would know that start to learn that one eighth is 12.5 percent and then so forth. So they go on and they um, start to be able to connect, you know that two eighths is actually 25% then. So they start to make all these connections between um, fractions and percentages, which are going to help with uh, meeting a lot of those expectations. And then the next set sort of works on um, guide students to compose and decompose whole numbers and find relationships between fractions and percentages. So in the second example here from chapter five, they're finding, you know, 10% of 360, 50%, uh, if they know 50% of something, they can find 25% of something. And if they know 50% and 25%, they can put that together to find 75%. So they're really working on these um, relationships um, to uh, be able to do some of the next work that they're going to. Um, sometimes some of these two you can represent by doing a lot of those um, area models, right? Um, where you have the fractions and the percentages both on the same um, area model. So maybe something like, right? So if you're doing like this, right? You know that if this is one quarter, this is also, right, 25%. And then if you know one eighth would be in here, right, you know that's going to be half of the 25. So you can do a lot of those models too, to help bring in the visual connections. I remember just that real life connection too, of being able to figure out, you know, when you're shopping or whatever, uh, yeah. how much money you're going to save if something's 15% off. And I remember shopping with my mom and she'd always be able to like calculate it like that. And I'm like, I have no idea how you even thought about that. Right. <laughs> I was, that was before I really started teaching fractions and understanding that myself. Right. Well, like, can I jump in for one minute? Yes, yes please, um, Just talking about the benchmark fractions. So the benchmark fractions are so, so important in, in life, but especially in this book. Um, so one thing that I really hammered home with my guys was that like we were going to know our benchmark fractions, right? So we were going to know one half, one quarter, one eighth, one third, one sixth. Um, and then we kind of got into one fifth and one tenth as well. 
Um, but what I did for some of my guys that were struggling to remember that is they kind of made their own little cheat sheet. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is when we get into the next set of questions, ideally number talks are mental um, and mental math, but it, be, it begins to be tricky to hold all the information in their brain. Like, especially when you see the next one where we're ordering uh, fractions, decimals, percents, we're trying, they're trying to convert, they're trying to hold all this information. Um, so for some of my students, they found it really helpful to kind of have a little cheat sheet inside their desk. They pull it out and they can see, oh yeah, some of that information starts to become really valuable. Some of them will just remember it and it's, they'll, the facts will rhyme off for you. You'll be really impressed, um, but some of them will need that little bit of accommodation, right? Um, and just like going to the next slide, when you see what we're doing next, um, this is one where we struggled with um, when they start getting to ordering numbers from least to greatest, where you, you're gonna find that some students may need a whiteboard to do this. Um, and once again, I mean, you're gonna be responsive to your students, you know what they need. Um, but I found with some of my seven eights, they couldn't access the problem without using a whiteboard. Like it was just too much for them to try and hold in their head. Um, so you might find a point when you're diving into this book that you decide that, you know what, guys, you're, it's okay to use a whiteboard um, if, if that's what you need to access this problem. Definitely. Even when I was looking at this, like sort of prepping and I was like, okay, well, this is 12.5. Um, then I thought about 5.8. Well, that's like 4.8, which is going to be right half. And then the one eighth, right, which is 12.5. And then, so I kind of needed to record that for myself to be able to add it together, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then once they've sort of developed those benchmark fractions, um, the idea then is that you can start ordering. So we're still not into operations yet in chapter four. We're still working on um, sort of um, understanding the different, what am I trying to say here? We're still trying to understand using all the benchmarks, working in between some fractions and decimals and percents. Understanding and then, how they relate to each other. Yes, how they relate to each other. Thanks, Leslie, before <laughs> we're doing any operational work. Um, so I thought we could look at this one here, um, E. So when students look at one of these, they first need to sort of look and decide, okay, am I going to convert these into um, decimals? Would it be easier to convert them into fractions? Because some questions work one way or the other, so they have to start being able to think about that. So just wondering what students might think here if we looked at E, how they might tackle ordering those ones there. Any ideas of what your students might do? Or even what you what you do, what your brain does, right? Because yeah. probably it's going to be different for everybody. People who are really great at changing to percents are probably going to go right to percents. Like Jordan, I'm going to guess you're going to go right to percents. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Some will relate, yeah, to money. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of people were thinking about money right there. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. when you see that one quarter and 75. Yeah. Money um, context can definitely be used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we started thinking about percentages or decimals, I guess, we could think one quarter, we know, is we're thinking um, maybe 25%, right? Zero decimal two five or 25%, 34%. How might students tackle seven eighths? I think out of this string, that one's kind of the trickiest. Yeah, that's what Rachel was just saying in the chat. She's like, that's yeah. when students are going to struggle with the most. And I think you're absolutely right. And this is yeah. where I think it's important to have that whiteboard so that they don't lose all that other thinking when they're sort of thinking about seven eights. Mm -hmm. So what we they tend to do is we can use decomposing, just like we decompose numbers in um, the whole numbers group. We can also decompose um, fractions, just like we decompose whole numbers. So I think seven eighths, we probably want to think about the four eighths because we know that that's a half, right? So that's 50% right there. And then we still have three eighths. And if we've worked on those benchmark fractions, like Jordan has said, we know that students might already know that one eighth is 12.5 and two eighths 
then would be 25. So 3 eighths is going to be 12.5 or 25 plus the 12.5. Okay, to get a total of 37.5. So we know now that that's what 3 eighths is, and they put it with the 4 eighths to find 87.5, which then we know that this one is actually the largest, which makes sense because that is 7 eighths is getting pretty close to a whole. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they could, yeah, Trevor. So procedurally, yeah, definitely they might want to pull out a calculator, but we are hoping we can, with the background knowledge we've built, right, with understanding the what 1 eighth is, um, and what two eighths is and what four eighths is that they could reason to think about, um, figure out what seven eighths would be as a decimal or a percent. Mm -hmm. Always too coming back to having them like prove their thinking. Like, how do you know that seven eighths is, is the largest one? Cause I think I would probably look at that and then I could order them easily, but I might not necessarily be able to prove seven eighths. So yeah. sort of going into that conversation as well. Yeah, and definitely they could, like Corey just said, they're going to estimate like it's going to be close to 100%, not quite. Maybe it's somewhere, maybe closer to 90, right? So having that confidence of knowing just what 7 8 is, is mm -hmm. going to give them um, an estimate of where that might be in that lineup. Yeah, and I think like once you, you'll be surprised because they become so comfortable with benchmarks that mm -hmm. like my guys would have looked at that question and said okay well i know eight eighths is a hundred percent and i know one eighth is twelve and a half percent so i'm just going to take a hundred subtract twelve and a half i'm at 87 and a half awesome. and once again they wouldn't have done that if they just looked at this question right now they wouldn't have done that that was with you know all the um work that led up to that with all the benchmarks and looking at so many benchmarks that it became a pretty easy routine for them to do that but it's you know built on the work before. Yeah, and this is great because um, this is exactly what we're hoping to see, right? Like this kind of was my thinking to putting it, breaking into four eights and three eights. But like, this is what's gonna happen in a classroom. Another student might say, hey, well, I knew, you know, what Jordan said. And all of a sudden, you know what? Now I have Jordan's strategy. I'm like, oh, anytime it's like, you know, seven eights or, or another fraction like that, that's just one away from 100%, I could just take away that one if I know what uh, that is as a decimal. So that's awesome. Yeah, I think so, too, like, um, I was just gonna say quickly that um, you might, like the way these are sort of set up, you know, you can see this one, like A, B, C, D, E, F, like you're not gonna do all of those in one day. You're gonna maybe pick one to do, or if time allows, you're gonna pick two to do so that then they can sort of practice for those of them who did those students who didn't have a chance to get in on the first one. Uh, but we do want to keep number talks to like 10, 15 minutes. I know I'm super guilty of having them go much longer than that. Um, but we do want to try to keep them to about 10, 15 minutes. So maybe you're just going to do one of those comparing and ordering for your number talk that day. Uh, Janice was wondering, would it be easier to set up as seven eighths as a ratio to whatever over a hundred. I don't know, Jordan, if that thing could speak to you. Um, at times students would do that, especially like when we were going through like our proportional reasoning unit. So you started to see like other strategies coming into the fold. Um, like I can only speak to like my classes. I think they got very, very comfortable with using percents. Um, so that was kind of a go-to for a lot of them, but uh, we definitely did see like more proportional reasoning as time went on and using those like, you know, equivalent ratios and, and whatnot. So I think you could definitely see that at times. Um, I think like with the seven eights, that one would be a little bit trickier because obviously, you know, eight doesn't go into a hundred um, evenly. So they might not have used it there, but other times for sure. Like we, I was just in a seven, eight um, at Lampton Centennial and we were looking at some, I mean, like four fifths is, is a fraction that a lot of students might represent, but you know, a lot of students from there were going to their equivalent fractions at a 10 and then they were realizing like, oh, well, eight tenths is 80%, right? And making that jump. So you'll see them get there in different ways. Sometimes it's kind of becomes that rote memorization that they just know four fifths is 80%. And then you'll see uh, some equivalents and 
I mean, they'll, they'll get there in different ways, but um, they'll start to get there, which is really neat. Mm -hmm. We want to like as much as possible have them and although they might be using a whiteboard or something, we want as much as possible them to be using their reasoning and their mental math skills when we're doing the number talks, but we're doing some problem solving or something with, we might work with some other strategies or, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So after they have done this and they built all the foundations, we can start to get into some operational work with fractions. Yeah, so chapter six is focusing on uh, addition number talk or fraction number talks. Um, they have sort of the three big ideas that are key to understanding the addition of fractions outlined in that chapter. I just thought I'd mention them quick. So the students need to know that they need to have that understanding that uh, fractions are distinct numbers. They need to know what it means for fractions to be equal to another, that they need to be understand that equivalency. And they need to be able to recognize what happens when fractions are combined. So the book again has different examples. It starts with um, like, you can see the pictures there up on the screen. So they've actually got area models up there to sort of help them see it. And then they've also got linear models. Um, and then they've also got set models to help them see that. And then the book goes into um, another section uh, where it doesn't provide those models. So then, but again, knowing those benchmarks of a half plus a half equals a whole, so now that we know that, how can we use what we already know to solve the next problem? So the one that we look at there was um, just A. So if we know a half plus a half equals a whole, how can we use that to help us figure out a half plus five eighths? And how might students sort of think about that? I don't know if you want a minute to think or if you want a minute to let it sort of think it through yourself or how would you show your thinking? Anybody wants to share? What might students see? Yeah, yeah, convert. So we know that one half is gonna be equal to four eighths. And since I know four eighths is now has that same denominator. So now my question is four eighths plus five eighths. And all of a sudden I can see that altogether that's nine eighths. Hopefully they'll know that after all that work on creating those benchmarks, right? Benchmarks of a half. Mm -hmm. So we might wanna also try to model that. Mm -hmm. I should have had these drawn before. <laughs> yeah, so we can see one half plus five eighths. And then hopefully they'll be able to see, oh, I can take this and move it up here to make one whole. And then what I have left is one eighth. So it would be one eighth, or sorry, one whole and one eighth. Mm -hmm. Sort of showing that thinking into using an area model. Mm -hmm. Great. Janine was saying too that you could also decompose, like kind of we did in the last one, mm -hmm. five eighths into four eighths and one eighth. Yes. Perfect. And the book does a really good job of showing how to record that actually. Mm -hmm. Probably not doing the best job right now. I should have <laughs> had that handy. <laughs> oh, yes. This is how they do it. So they would show it like this one half plus four eighths plus one eighth, right? And then we could even change one half so that we have four eighths plus four eighths plus one eighth. And then hopefully students can see that if we combine this, that's gonna give us one whole and then we have one whole plus one eighth left. Awesome. 
No. So lots of that's a you know pretty I don't want to say basic question, but beginning edition question, kind of like I think that's at the beginning, right, Leslie, of the edition ones, but yes, lots of different is. ways to like represent that and solve it, which is neat. Because so again, yeah. we're seeing different strategies, different kids um, at different spots can bring in different strategies to help them solve these questions. And I think really getting students to the point where like they can think about and reason through the fractions instead of having to go to that find a common denominator. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know like when I was in the classroom teaching like five, six and that curriculum expectation got brought down to that, like adding fractions never used to be in grade six. So then when it was brought down to that level, um, I just taught adding fractions through my number talks like and reasoning about it. I didn't I didn't try to teach them the procedure of find a common denominator and I don't know. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Not saying I'm, I'm not saying that's the right way. I'm just saying that that's how I did it. <laughs> it was like yeah. we spent so much time on fractions already trying yeah. to develop their understanding that I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. It's kind of nice to be able to pick away at this through the year. Yeah. And instead of coming to a fractions unit and which, yeah. you know, I think as coaches, we've been in the position where we've been in many classrooms mm -hmm. um, in the um, spring and we're going, oh my gosh, we need to teach fractions and we're starting at ground zero. So yeah. um, with all the things that have happened over the last few years as well, yeah. so picking away at this through the year really eases um, trying to get these concepts covered. And you can keep coming back to this, like doing a quick adding fractions number talk, like, like Jordan was saying, you know, maybe you're going to do a couple of whole number number talks a week, and then you're going to maybe do some fraction decimal percent ones other times mm -hmm. in the week. Yep. And just like the other number talks book, how there's like different strategies for adding, there's different strategies for adding fractions that you would go through to nudge students towards different strategies. And then it happens the same again. The next chapter seven is all on subtraction with fractions. And again, lots of um, pictures to model how you can represent student thinking and different um, strategies that the students could use to um, solve um, the subtraction of fractions. I know we're running short on time. So I think we should. I was just going to quickly add in there too. Oh. A lot of times they yeah. talk, no, that's fine. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, talk about the importance of putting it in a context. Yeah. Right? Like maybe students can't understand, um, like they need some sort of an entry point. So giving that context about, you know, he ate a half a brownie and then he ate three quarters more of a brownie. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, that maybe wasn't the best one, but. <laughs> yeah, there, and there are examples, again, just like those examples of the strategies and how you could represent them. There is context examples too that are helpful. So yeah, chapter six is adding fractions. Chapter seven is um subtracting fractions and then we get into chapter eight that jordan's gonna touch on which is then getting into multiplying fractions yeah so uh i'll go through this quick as we said we're we're getting short on time here um so as you can see these questions aren't uh crazy difficult they start to get a little bit more difficult as the book progresses so right now this is just uh multiplying a fraction by a whole number um and then you start to get into multiplying fractions by fractions and you get into uh, multiplying multiple whole numbers by fractions. So there's uh, lots of progression. I mean, once again, it, it becomes responsive, right? Like if you think that your group, you know, one quarter times eight is too easy, maybe you change it to one quarter times 250, right? Like you can start to change those numbers around based on the needs of your group. Um, but it's just kind of following along the progression is going to you know, help your students build these strategies and build their repertoire. Um, so I'm just going to switch between devices or screens a little bit here. Um, so I'll give you a sec to think about, hopefully you're already thinking about how you would solve this question or how your students would solve this question. I can't see uh, the chat. So um, I'm just going to kind of tell you how my guys would have thought about it. Um, so for, if we're looking at, um, I'm going here. If we're looking at this question, uh, one quarter times eight, um, once again, like my guys, maybe, maybe too much relied on percents, but, um, they are really comfortable working with percentages. So, um, I know that they would have thought about this as, um, one quarter, of eight, because we talked about that quite a bit, um, they would have started to think about, well, they know that a quarter 
is 25% of eight. Um, and a lot of them, depending on their level, may have jumped to thinking about 50% of eight, because um, that would be nice and easy for them, which they would know as four. Um, and then they know that 25% is half of 50. So four divided by two is two. So I know like that's kind of what my guys would have been thinking there um, based on all the work we did. So if we were kind of looked at, I mean, half of eight, I think is a pretty easy one, but if we kind of thought about three quarters of eight, same thing, I know a lot of mine would have kind of gone back to, well, I know that 50% is equal to four, 25% is equal to two. So if I put those together, I'm gonna to get six. So we know that students like would be capable of, you know, putting um, eight over one and going one times eight is eight, and, uh, four times one is four and four goes into eight, but do they really understand what they're doing when they just follow that procedure, right? Versus thinking about, oh, well, if I have 50% of eight or 25% of eight, they're actually understanding, um, you know, how the numbers are changing and why they're changing. So hopefully that makes sense for those ones. Um, once again, like depending um, some on classes. Sorry, Jordan. I was just gonna oh, say, I was just gonna say that... go ahead. All right, keep going, keep going. You go. I was just gonna say, and that like if you're really using number lines a lot um to represent thinking, then they might be able to, you know, show that in a number line as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I was just gonna say, like, depending on the time too, like maybe you just go through string A. Sometimes, you know, you might go through a couple strings because they're pretty quick, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that's what I would have seen from my students. Um, certainly there's different ways and you would see different ways, right? And, and uh, different strategies for those questions, but that's just kind of showing, you know, where you can progress to with these. Anything that you guys have to add? Sorry, I was muted there. Uh, yeah, just a couple of people were talking about that, being able to draw models, right? Um, of like, you know, whether it's a area model or a uh, number line or drawing um, models of what three quarters would be, counting the shaded pieces. So lots of different ideas there about how we can also make it um, visual for them. I think maybe you'll find too, as they progress through the book using models, um, maybe some will continue to use it, but maybe some will be able to um, go forward um, just sort of with that innate knowledge. I think we have yeah. to wrap up though. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna say, and I think like with the models, um, like in like like in that specific context, like an, uh, a set model would be a good way to solve that question. Yeah. We tried to push them away from models because when you start to look at some of the questions, you know, and it's it's six sevenths or it's fifteen seventeenths, and then you have students trying to draw out seventeenths, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of figure out pretty quickly that it's not accurate. So trying to work with the numbers, but you know, depending on the context and where your students are at, then sometimes the models can be great and visuals can be really great. And then sometimes you might have to pull up something like the math learning center mm -hmm. and pull out the fraction strips and stuff like that to really show the difference, right? So once again, it's it's being responsive to your group. Exactly. Being responsive. I always love that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we should wrap up because I know another session needs to use this Zoom link, but uh, thank you everybody for coming today. I hope that, uh, we hope, that you know we uh, shared with you some good information. Uh, I do need to switch my screen here. There we go. Uh, just in case you're wondering who we are and how to get a hold of us, if you want your coach's name, um, they're there, and we are happy to uh, to touch base with you at any point. Awesome. Oh, Jordan, anything to add? <laughs> no, I was just going to say, yeah, reach out to us when we're in your schools. We're always happy to come in and model one of these number talks for you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not one of the teachers we're directly working with, we're always happy to pop into other classrooms. And um, yeah, love to meet people and get in classes and, and help however we can. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, um, even if we're not working with you and you want to email us, email us and let us know. And we are happy to answer questions and try and guide you as best we can. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.